and away we go. Good afternoon, everybody. It's the 21st of May, 2018, half past four in the afternoon. Uh, have to bear with me a little bit, just while I get used to recording my own voice. So much more like playing music than actually recording my thoughts, but uh, I can't think of another way to be able to try and get my point across to anybody about uh, some of the information that I've learned in the past month or so regarding how beneficial sound could be to the human body. So, uh, needs is must, I have to listen back to myself, but uh, so long as the information that I'm about to present to you is as beneficial to you as it has been to me, then that's a positive thing, surely. Anyway, so like I say, I'm just recording this to just do a little bit of a presentation regarding a book that I stumbled across called uh, Sacred Sounds, Transformation Through Music and Word by Ted Andrews. The book was released in 1992. Uh, discover your direct line to the divine. Quite a bold statement in itself, like, but uh, sound has always been considered a direct link between humanity and the divine. The ancient mystery schools all taught their students how to use sound as a creative and healing force. Now sacred sounds reveal to today's seekers how to tap into the magical and healing aspects of voice, resonance and music. On a physical level, these techniques have been used to alleviate aches and pains, lower blood pressure and balance hyperactivity in children. On a metaphysical level, they have been used to induce altered states of consciousness, open new levels of awareness, stimulate intuition and cre increase creativity. An exciting book that brings together the resonances found in the spoken word, music and sound in order to create inner balance and healing. His extensive appreciation of the subtleties of tone gives us a greater understanding of the myriad of ways we are each influenced by sound and the effects on our chakras and lives. Fascinating reading that gives you a lot to think about. It's a fun handbook. Ted Andrews has done his homework. He recapulates some of the most interesting ancient beliefs in the powers of sound and music. Uh, consideration of these mythical traditions brings greater awareness to the new emerging science of vibration and transformation. Quite a bold statement just from the beginning, you'd say. Anyway, move on to the next little bit. Uh, unleash your creative potential. At the heart of all the lost traditions was the teaching of the power of word, the ability to use music and voice to affect changes in others and in oneself. Every society, tradition and religion has had these teachings, both magical and wondrous. The relaying of these teachings usually fell on individuals schooled to the nature and spiritual laws of the universe. These priests, priestess magicians used their secret arts of sound to instruct, heal and enlighten. They imbued their words with the power of the imagination and the power of music. Healing, song and sorcery went hand in hand, whether they were the African griots, uh, the Norse skalds, the Anglo-Saxon glee men, the French troubadours, I'm not even going to try and pronounce those words, I'm struggling enough as it is, <laughs> but you can see them all there for yourself. Uh, their myths, stories, poems and songs bridge the different worlds of life and the different modes of consciousness and they kept the traditions of esoteric mysteries alive for the people. The ancient tradition of the word is not lost. It is a living creative art. It involves magical storytelling to help us leap from the endless spirals of day-to-day -day life to a quicker path of achievement. It involves opening to heal and be healed through music and sound. It involves opening to seership through the force of poetry and song. It is this tradition which is revealed in this book. It is a tool by which we can unfold the creative potential that lies within, and this is the renaissance which is celebrated by sacred sounds. Uh, a little bit about the author. Ted Andrews is a full-time author, student and teacher in the metaphysical and spiritual fields. He conducts seminars, symposiums and workshops and lectures throughout the country on many facets of ancient mysticism. Ted works with past life analysis, auric interpretation, numerology, the tarot and the Kabbalah as methods of developing and enhancing inner potential. He is a clairvoyant and certified in spiritual mediumship, basic hypnosis and acupressure. Uh, Ted is also involved in the study of the use of herbs as an alternative path. In addition to writing several books, he is a contributing author to various metaphysical magazines. If you wish to contact the author or would like more information about this book, please write to the author in care of Llewellyn Worldwide and we will forward your request. Both the author and publisher appreciate hearing from you in learning of your enjoyment of the book and how it, can, how it has helped you. Lowen and Worldwide cannot guarantee that every written letter to the author will be answered, but all will be forwarded. And here's an address that you can write to. A free catalogue from Llewellyn. For more than 90 years, Llewellyn has brought its readers knowledge in the fields of metaphysics and human potential. Learn about the newest books in spiritual guidance, natural healing, astrology, occult philosophy and more. 
Enjoy book reviews, new age articles, a calendar of events, plus current advertised products and services. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sure you can see all that. This is just the, the warm-up before you get to the actual girth as such of the story. Right, here we go. Uh, about Llewellyn's practices guide to magic and personal power. Uh, to some people, the idea that magic is practical comes as a surprise. It shouldn't. The entire basic of magic is to exercise influence over one's personal world in order to satisfy our needs and goals. And while this magic is also concerned with psychological transformation and spiritual growth, even the spiritual life must be built on firm material foundations. Here are practical and usable techniques that will help you to a better life, will help you attain things you want, will help you in your personal growth and development. Moreover, these books can change your life dynamically positively. The material world and the psychic are intertwined and it is this that establishes the magical link that mind, soul, spirit can easily influence the material. Psychic powers and magical practices can and should be used in one's daily life. Each of us has many wonderful yet underdeveloped talents and powers. Surely we have an e evolutionary obligation to make full use of our human potentials. Mind and body work together and magic is simply the extension of this interaction into dimensions beyond the limits normally conceived. Why be limited? All the things you will ever want or will ever be must have their start in your mind. In these books you are given practical guidance to develop your inner powers and apply them to your everyday needs. These abilities will eventually belong to everybody through natural evolution but you can learn and develop them now. This series of books will help you achieve such things as success, happiness, miracles, the power of ESP, healing, out of body travel, clairvoyance, divination, extended powers of mind and body, communication with non-physical beings, and knowledge of non-material means. Bold statement, I know. We've always known of things like this, seemingly supernatural, super normal achievements, often by quite ordinary people. We are told that we normally only use 10% of our human potential. We are taught that faith can move mountains, that love heals all hurt, that miracles do occur. We believe these things to be true, but most people lack practical knowledge of them. This book in the series form of a full library of magical knowledge and practice. And just to the right hand side, you can see a, a list of books that Ted Andrews has done. But like, if I just want to sum that up a little bit. Some quite bold statements there, really. Uh, depends if you believe in magic or not, and what you believe as to be magic is... It's all a uh, slight hand, really. When a magician does a card trick, you know, you see what's in front of you, but you can't see what's behind as such. You believe that he's doing a trick, but there is usually another side to it that you don't understand, hence it being classed as magic. Again, I don't want to say that listening to this will give you the powers of uh, ESP, uh, out of body travel, and being able to communicate with non physical beings, but uh, I really hope that it can help you in the way that it's helped me which is understand a little bit about my depression a little bit what i've been through and how i've been able to move forward from that yeah sorry about that little dog barking in the background i think she saw a bird out the window but uh anyway back to uh the more pressing matters at hand uh so here we are introduction the heart of the lost traditions Every society expresses its truths in the manner most acceptable and most easily understood by its members. When explored, the truths of one society is not as different from the others as which we often believe. There are common threads and methods which run through them all. At the heart of all the lost traditions was the teaching of the power of the word, the ability to use sound, voice and music to create changes in oneself or in others. Every society, tradition and religion has its teachings, both magical and wondrous. The relaying and demonstrating of these wondrous teachings fell to individuals who were schooled in the natural and spiritual laws of the universe. These priests, priestess, magicians, regardless of how they were labelled in their society, used the secret arts of sound and music and words to teach, heal and enlighten. They imbued their words with the power of imagination and the power of music. The myths, the stories, the poems, the songs were used to bridge the different worlds of life and the different modes of consciousness. They can be used to do so again. This tradition of the word is not truly lost. It is obscure, but it still lives within the tales, the myths and the songs of the past. Remnants exist and can be gathered and re-expressed with a new life today. The heart of the lost tradition of the word still lives within the imagination of all.
Let there be light is the divine prompting to awaken and to use a creative imagination. The Elizabethan writers use the phrase intending the mind. This intending is the fixing of the mind upon something, focusing with a clear and steady flame, a flame that brings illumination. We must intend to mind to create new expressions of this lost tradition. We must fill our words, myths and music with the power of the imagination. All words and sounds are essentially magical, and yet the paradox is they must be rendered magically. The words and sounds are seeds, holding the essence of magic and light. Unless those seeds are nurtured and helped to take root, the magic lies dormant or it grows within our lives in peculiar ways. The lost tradition of the word is a living creative art. It involves understanding and using the power of sound, music and words. It involves the art of magical storytelling to help ourselves and others leap from the endless uh, cycle, help us leap from the endless cycles and spirals of day-to-day -day life and find a direct and quicker passage to achievement. It involves opening to heal and be healed through music and sound. It involves opening to seership through the sheer force of poetry and song. It involves opening the magical visions and dreams of life. The tradition of the word is a fairy chest of treasures. The treasures within can be used by each of us in our own way. The treasures can be exchanged for something wanted or needed. They may be enjoyed for themselves. This chest, this tradition, comes with great responsibility. It demands concentration. It demands that we learn to use, not waste the treasures. It demands understanding the profound influence sound has and how it affects all of us. You must remember that a tradition is not a religion. It is a tool by which you can unfold the creative potential that lies within. It is a tool that creates circumstances in your normal day-to-day -day life that can open doors to your potential. The lost tradition of the word is the riddle of paradox. Once learnt, there must be a joy in its sharing. It is something that you keep, even while you give it away. You must never hoard it and never give it directly, or its virtue will be lost. You must use it to stay upon the higher path, and yet use it also to know when to step off. You can work with it to have a way of your own, and have it entirely. You can take the old and express it as a new. There is a kind of death to every story when it leaves the speaker and becomes impaled for all time on clay tablets or written and printed pages. To take this from the page, to create it again into living substance, this is the challenge. I think that kind of kind of sums it up well, really. The last bit there, the lost tradition of the word is a riddle of paradox. Once learned, there must be a joy in its sharing. It's something that you keep even while you give it away. You must never hoard it and never give it up directly or its virtue will be lost. This is the only reason that I'm forcing myself to record my voice today. So I put this on Facebook a few weeks ago just so people who care about sound can have a look into what I've been looking into and realize that there is a lot more to it. Like we, we all know music moves us, especially a lot of people who will be listening to this will know me from music and from clubbing. We all know that when we're at a rave, when you hear a track, everybody's in unison together, hands up, whether that's got anything to do with the drinks and stuff that go around some nightclubs, whether that's got to do with consciousness, whether it's a mixture of the both. I'm not entirely sure. I'm merely trying to find out for myself because I don't believe what we've been taught in general is completely true. So, uh, like I say, don't believe me. I'm merely presenting this to you for you to look into. You can make your own decisions from it. <clears throat> I'm not sure if anybody can hear that noise in the background, but the dog is snoring right by my feet and she is quite a noisy little girl, so uh, you might have to put up with that, but I'm, I'm sure you get through it. <laughs> so where are we? Uh, part one, the secret power of the word. In the spheres, a wonderful harmony of sound is being produced eternally. And from that source, have all things been created? But like, I just had this one bit before I flip to the next page. Like they say words are weapons. You add S to the word word, you've got a sword. I don't think that's a coincidence really, but uh, right, let's skip forward to the next page. Chapter 1, Science of Sacred Sound. Sacred sound, whether as prayer, music, song, incantation or chants, is a vital force which uh, permeates every aspect of creation. In the New Testament, the book of John states, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Ethiopian cosmology, God said it to have created both himself and the universe through the utterance of his own name. In Egypt, uh, Toph used words to create the universe, calling out over the waters, come unto me. 
Even in the early Babylonian cosmology, the gods mothered the Tiamat in the waters of life did not emerge as being until they were named. Sound has always been considered a direct link between humanity and the divine. At some point, all of the ancient mystery schools taught their students the use of sound as a creative and healing force. It is considered the oldest form of healing and was a predominant part of the early teachings of the Greeks, Chinese, East Indians, Tibetans, Egyptians, American Indians, the Mayas and the Aztecs. The Chinese healers used singing stones, thin flat pieces of jade which would emit various musical tones when struck. One of the notes was designated the Kung, or Great Tone of Nature. It corresponds in our own musical scale to the tone of F or F sharp. The Sufis consider Hu to be the ultimate creative sound. The Tibetans considered the tones of F sharp, A and G to be the three powerful and sacred tones of the world. Om, Om and Amen were believed by many ancient societies and traditions to represent all the sounds in the human voice was capable of expressing and manifesting in the physical world. The Essens, a third sect of Jews living in the world at the time of the Master Jesus Christ, uh, were dynamic healers. Their name comes from the word Asaya, which means to heal or to doctor. They were schooled in the mystic and healing arts of sound and nature. Much of what we know from the past regarding the teachings of sacred sounds comes through the musical and architectural remnants of those times. Uh, sculptures in Baghdad dating to around 4000 BC show several musicians playing harps and flutes. Music and sound as an art form was well developed by the Egyptians, Hindus, Chinese and Japanese. By the time Egypt built the pyramids and sphinxes it had organised choruses of 12,000 voices and orchestras of 600 pieces. Many believe it was through their use of directed and controlled sound that much of the heaviest labour was accomplished on the pyramids. From the early Greeks come some of the earliest scientific observations on sound and its true nature and effects. The Greek master Orpheus was too many of the ancient mystics uh, the theologian par excellence. He was a poet, a musician, theologian, and even an interpreter of the gods. He was considered the first world singer. The Greek mythology speak of him as the son of Apollo, the father of truth, wisdom, and divination. However, you pronounce it, like I say, I'm, I'm not the best reader. His mother was Calliope, one of the muses. It was her that he received his gift of music, music capable of moving immovable objects. Orpheus is often considered the great hierophant of the Diocesan Mysteries. He instructed the Greeks in magic and music, and the power of the healing voice and music was ascribed to certain magical formula. Incantations and charms are described in the ancient Orphic tablets. The name Orpheus means he who heals by the light, and it is quite probable that it was a title of a particular level of healing achievement through the application of sacred sounds. Initiation of the Orphic Mysteries, performed by priestly sorcerers and healers, was supposed to spare the soul of the cycle of reincarnation. To avoid new birth, certain magical formulas were learnt by heart. Uh, the dead man was allowed to drink the waters of a living spring, whereupon he cast off his carnal nature, in which sin inherited and thus purified, reigned among the heroes. The Pythagorean, or Platonic schools of wisdom would arise partially from the Orphic Mystery teachings. Pythagoras created the modern musical octave, in an attempt to reveal the relationship between musical notes and the mathematical principles of the universe. Other Greeks and Romans would add to our modern awareness of the physical and metaphysical effects of sound. Aristotle presented humanity with one of the earliest theories of how sound was transmitted through the air. Uh, polio, circa 20 BC, uh, lent tremendous insight into the acoustics of buildings and the power of echo and reverberation. With reverberation, diffusion of sound occurs. A reverberated sound is one which re-echoes many times. The reverberations impinge upon the ears of the body, giving the impression of being within a sea of sound. It is this effect that was created through strong, repeated invocations and chants, filling the temple or room with the force of energy being invoked. This helped to create a space acceptable for its physical manifestation or for the raising of the consciousness of the individual to a sense of unity with the divine force. Uh, the Greek amphitheatres exhibited highly advanced knowledge of acoustical properties. They were free from noise, they increased speech, and they retained the richness of the music. The Greeks even constructed shells to further direct and reflect sounds in specific patterns. This would eventually carry over to the Gothic cathedrals constructed by masons schooled in such techniques. The chants and songs would lift the consciousness of the individual to new heights. Many societies had forbidden certain kinds of music, especially in the formative years of the children. There was more extensive awareness of how sound played upon all aspects of humanity and could trigger problems in health and balance. In those societies which practiced musical restraint, part of the overall education of the individual included training in the musical arts. 
By the time of the Roman Empire, many of the restraints were no longer practiced except in the more closed societies and traditions. It is unique that one of the most powerful emperors of Rome, Julius Caesar, recognised the influence of sound upon the well-being of people and to the extent of which he went so far to issue a noise ordinance and even had straw laid over the city streets to soften the noise. Since the time of early Greeks and the Roman Empire, the teachings of sacred sound and the power of the word has been passed down through what we now generally call the Bardic tradition. Through the Greek Rhapsodists, the English Bards, the French Troubadours, the African Griots, the Norse Skalds, etc, etc, the power to teach, heal and raise consciousness through sound, music and voice has been kept alive. Although today most people are either unaware or simply ignore the, signific the significance of sound within their lives, this ancient knowledge is even more important within a technological society in which we are constantly bombarded with noise. The sound is a major contributing factor to our present state of consciousness. The difference between the random sounds of daily life and the focused use of sacred sounds is that the latter produces harmony rather than dissonance. When we learn to produce direct sacred sounds through our energy centers, the chakras, to the physical body, a balance occurs which energizes our entire system. Then we have greater access to our true essence and its manifestation within our day-to-day -day life circumstances. We have greater health on all levels and we can disrupt negative qualities and patterns as they arise within our physical and subtle bodies. We transmute them into positive ones. We begin to direct the alchemic processes of life and it all begins with understanding the principles of sacred sound. The sacred sound principle of resonance. There are basic sound principles that we must understand if we are to apply the secret power of the word effectively within our lives. They serve as the foundation of all healing, enlightenment and the magic associated with the use of sound, music and voice. Resonance is the most important principle of sound in any form. It designates the ability of a vibration to reach out through vibrational waves and to set off a similar vibration in another body. Physics teach that life is composed of atoms which contain protons and electrons. These are electrically and magnetically charged particles of energy. They are in constant motion, at times more so than others, making their movements audible. The sound vibrations that physics speak of are connected to the vibrations of atoms and molecules within the air. These in the air cause pressure changes, resulting in sections of the air becoming denser and others more rarefied. Uh, these occur one after another in the manner of uh, rippling caused by a stone tossed into a pond. The sound vibrations set off air molecules in motion. They ripple outwards, propelled to and impacting upon any receiving set, such as the human body. Uh, audible sound vibrations enter the ear, causing the eardrum to vibrate. These vibrations are picked up by the nerves, which translate them into sound. When it is windy, it is more difficult to hear because the wind scatters the molecules, preventing them from condensing. The principle of resonance is most easily demonstrated through the use of a tuning fork and a piano. If we were to strike a tuning fork keyed to the tone of middle C and then raise the lid upon the piano, softly feeling along the piano wires, we would find that the piano wire for the middle C would be vibrating. The vibrations of the tuning fork triggered a response in that which was a similar frequency. Every cell within our body is a sound resonator. It has a capability of responding to any other sound outside of the body. Every organ in which cells of like vibrations have gathered to form an organ will respond as a group to particular sound vibrations. The various systems in the body will also respond to sound vibrations, as will various emotional, mental and spiritual states of consciousness. The human body is a bioelectrical system. The bioelectrical energy is created in varying frequencies through muscular action that can be altered, strengthened or balanced through the use of sacred sounds. This occurs through the quality of resonance. We can stimulate an immense number of sympathetic vibrations within our body and mind by learning to direct and control our voice and by using certain musical instruments, tones and forms of music. When there is imbalance, we can use directed sound to bring the imbalance back to its normal parameters. Our body knows how to take care of itself. Unfortunately, we do not always assist in its process. Through lack of exercise or poor diet, our system can get out of balance. When this occurs, the body must perform twice the work. It must first go about the job of restoring balance before it can correct and eliminate what created the imbalance. We can use sacred sound techniques to restore the balance and thus allow the body to do what it knows best. In metaphysics, we are taught that we are a microcosm of the universe. This means that we have all energies to some degree within us. In our physical or subtle bodies, we have all of the inherent energy vibrations of the universe. This vibration can be both physical and non-physical, involving tangible or intangible energies. Most humans find it easier to perceive the physical nature of a vibration. It is a definable and more tangible, such as pulsations in the air from sound or other sources. 
Vibrations that are not rec recognisably physical still affect us and can be sensed and felt if the intuitive and physical perceptions are heightened. We have a capability of resonating or responding to all sound vibration, positive or negative. We need to be alert to the sounds around us and to strengthen our energies so that only the beneficial sounds can permeate our individual energy fields. The transmission of a resonant vibration requires three things. First, there must be original vibrating energy source. This can be thought, sounds, colours, musical instruments or voices. Almost anything can set in motion the energy between two destinations. Second, there must be a transmitting medium with few exceptions. Almost everything is a good medium for transmitting sound vibrations. For humans, air is the most common carrier. The motion of the vibrating origin is passed from one molecule of air to another and so on. The human can pick up vibrations between 16 and 20,000 vibrations per second. However, the human body will still feel pulsations that are not heard. Those who develop the psychic ability known as uh, clairvoyance have raised their own energy to pick up even higher vibrational rates. Third, there must be the, a receiver of vibrations, something which will receive or respond to the energy of sound vibrations being sent. Remember, our entire body is a sound resonator with a ca capability of responding to a multitude of vibrations. This reception and response to outside vibrations can occur in a sympathetic manner or through a forced manner. Right, I now skip on a little bit uh, to shaking up negative energies. Slight diagram there saying. Um, about the body and chakras in which rigid negative energy patterns can lodge. This can then manifest in a physical illness. The rattle is used in a variety of ways depending upon the society and the illness. Uh, regardless of the variation, there are some universal patterns to its use. The entire body is encircled. This loosens up negative energy patterns that have lodged within the body. Then the rattle is shaken up and down all over the body to loosen the energies within the chakras. This allows for easier cleansing of the negative energies through other methods by the practitioner. And again, the next page I've skipped on a little bit. I didn't want to just fully read this book. I just wanted to bring to you some of the, the bits that I found a lot more beneficial. Like I say, I'll put a link to this book in wherever I post this, just because it's something that if you are feeling the positivity that I'm trying to put out of this message, I, I advise you look at it as soon as you get a chance. It's a bit of a read, but like I say, learning isn't always the best process. But here we are, so on to page 30. Uh, it's recognised that a child responds to sound even while in the womb. The earth is our mother now, our womb, and we need to learn to work with the sounds of the earth, much more creativity than in the past. You do not have to be gifted uh, to benefit from work with sacred sounds or music. Musicians are exceptional, but they are only gifted in the sense that they are willingly and lovingly received this gift which is available to all. They have taken what is part of us all, what is offered to us all, and then they have magnified it and made it their own. Even if we can't all be musicians, we can all be musical. The consequences of higher consciousness and divine communication live on through music. When played, music will continue to pulse outward into the field of energy beyond us long after the actual sound has faded from audible awareness. Look how often we hear a tune in the morning and we hum it within our head throughout the rest of the day. This phenomenon says much about the spiritual and lasting effects of music. It even tells us that the possibility of communicating by music with the unseen is immeasurable. The modern society views music in two ways, as an art form and as a commercial product. Music needs to be considered in a third way, as a power of a universal force. It is a force that was treated with great respect in ancient times. They recognised that the physical emission of sound was an outer and audible agency of the inner transformation. They recognised that music was in relationship of one tone to another, and that all life was in relationship to one individual to another. The power of music works because of a special content found in the expression of sound. This secret content is the pattern of sound emitted through various techniques, vocal or instrumental. For example, inspiration and intuition occurs through a repetition of regular musical structures, tones and patterns that change the brainwave pattern from the beta, normal consciousness, to an alpha pattern, altered state of awareness. Certain modes, major and minor, were deemed powerful. As a general rule, the minor modes were considered carriers of great force and power and could affect change in emotional and physical states. The major modes were uplifting and energising. The mi minor modes draw the energy into the physical and the major modes lift the individual to the spiritual. The manner of playing and singing the modes was considered powerful, some were literally banned by the church. Many believed that the voice was wedded to words and the instruments lacked this unity. Many of the early church leaders also associated many instruments with pagan life. The lyre and flute, for example, were strongly associated with pagan dances. 
even though the lyre and flute were used in worship by the Greeks, the use of such instruments was condemned by such figures such as uh, Clement of Alexandria, St Ambrose and St Augustine, who adjured believers not to turn hearts to theatrical instruments, even though Augustine exhorts the power of music and hymns. The church often believed that pa pagan musical instruments were derived from ancient magical powers that utilised music to invoke unseen beings and powers. This was especially true regarding the singing of hymns. The example in the development of singing polyphonic and interval of the minor second was prohibited. Things were frowned upon, the movement away from Gregorian chants towards secular and possibly pagan melodies as a basis for the mass. In the traditional Greek music, in the early chants and even in folk songs, the text and the melody were united. However, individual singers who could adjust the text of the mass to fit with the music using their own judgment were condemned by the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. Remember that date as well. We need to go back quite a while to be able to start understand how this information has been hidden from society. Uh, the difficulty today in reawakening much of the ancient knowledge and power of music lies in relating the old models to modern modes of awareness. The pitch ratio of ancient times would have been tempered to today's world. Our own energy and expression is much different than that of thousands of years ago. When we apply the musical principles of the past to the present, it is not the individual notes that are of key importance, but rather it is the relationship of one note to another. Western society's scale is chromatic. It includes the basic eight notes from C to the next higher pitch of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, which is like Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. It also includes the sharps and flats in between them. On the piano, this will constitute not only the white keys, but the black keys as well. Many ancient societies used a pentatonic scale based upon five distinct notes. This is comparable to the five black keys on the piano, however the black keys only represent one arrangement of the many possibilities in a pentatonic scale. Technically any five notes can be considered a pentatonic scale, there's some examples underneath. These are examples of pentatonic scales used in folk songs of these countries, there are others of course. Uh, I will get back to some of these hidden church modes that I found. Again. People might just be laughing at that comment about the church. If anybody who knows me, you will know that I'm not religious. I've been an atheist for years, but looking into this, it seems to make sense. So I, I don't want to say that I'm an atheist anymore. I'm willing to check out all possibilities. But anyway, where are we? Uh, the tones associated with the scales give each society its own distinct sounds. This is why what sound good to us in our society may be very different to others and vice versa. This is why Westerners often dislike or don't understand many Eastern forms of music. It's not that the Easterns are discordant or inharmonious, it's quite simply based upon a different scale, a scale that is usually quite in harmony with the energies of that people. Each society as an individual has its own energy system. We in the West use our energies in ways that are quite different from those in the East. It is only natural that the expression of these energies through music would also be quite different. It is not the number of notes within a particular scale that provides its force or impact, but rather it is the succession. The relationship between one note and the next provides a clue to the use of music for healing and for achieving higher states of consciousness. It is the order in which they are played in conjunction with the rhythm that creates the impact. Uh, certain combinations of tones and rhythms have very specific effects upon our physical, emotional, mental and spiritual states. The order and rhythms of tones and the mixing of tones into various melodies is a source of magic. We can learn to combine tones, vocal or instrumental, to link energies of the body together. This can be done to facilitate healing, intuition, dream enlightenment, communicating with spirits or for invoking divine presences. This will explore a number of these techniques through this book. Healing Elements of Music we can employ musical rhythms, tones, instruments and vocations to interact with the various activities of the physiological systems of the body. The key to working with healing music is to understand how the chakra system relates to the physical and subtle aspects of our energies. Now, I'll just digress ever so slightly. The one strange thing that I found out was that I'd been living with a Reiki master for over four years who'd explained a little bit, tried giving me a little bit of Reiki, but I was... Uh, I was a little bit dubious, I wasn't sure whether it was just the putting of the hands close and it was the heat that was being transferred as opposed to it being energy that's transferred, 
but anyway, like I say, I've lived with a Reiki master for over four years, and I've stumbled across this myself, I explained it to her, and she, she explained that, yeah, you have pretty much got it nail on the head here, but I worked this out only by tying it that the seven chakras all tie to one of the seven notes on the chromatic scale. Anyway, so where are we? Uh, the chakra system. The electromagnetic elements of the body are the strongest at the chakra points of the body. These emanations occur in the front and the back of the body. Uh, the chakra and the primary mediators of all energy already in the body and all energy coming into the body. These mediate the electromagnetic impulses of our energy system. The chakras take the energy expressions and help the body distribute them for various physical, emotional, mental and spiritual functions. Although not part of the physical body, they link the subtle energy field that is surrounding the physical body to the activities of the body. And you can see on the diagram here, uh, starting at the bottom, we've got root or base, uh, spleen, solar plexus, heart, throat, brow and crown. And this links to the seven areas. And here we go. This was the bit that when I first saw about this book, I skipped straight to these pages because I had a feeling that I knew what it was going to say just from learning how to play the piano at a young age and having music as a part of my life. I had an idea, but it, it wasn't until I started reading it that it really struck home that, yeah, I've, I've landed on something here that could be beneficial for everyone. So here we have on the left-hand side, uh, the metaphysical elements of music. Uh, you can see the spine going C, D, E, F, G, A, B, with what I've just explained from the last page. The left-hand side shows about rhythm, melody and harmony and certain instruments that can be used to invoke that. Then on the right-hand side, again, we're going into a more spiritual side of it again believe it if you want you don't have to believe it again i'm just portraying this I'd, I'd hate for people to just take my word for things that's one of the issues in the world everybody just takes people's word on the first thing they hear without actually researching the evidence but you can see at the bottom physical kundalini moving up slightly it gets into the creativity part of the human psyche moving up a little bit further gets into clairtessence and psychic ability uh, moving up a bit higher, we get into the mental and spiritual side that apparently involves healing, higher intuition, more creativity. And then when we get to a higher spiritual level, past mental, we get to higher clairvoyance, uh, visualisation, which should be classed as ESP, spiritual vision or cosmic consciousness. Right, so uh, this was the interesting bit for me. I specifically wanted to look into a certain key. It was one of my favourite favorite keys to work in when I wasn't trying remixes. If I was going to go for a bass key, I would always start on that bass tone and then move from there sort of thing. But I will start on C and move up just so you can hear a little bit about... It's more at the bottom of each page, the emotional slash mental attitudes of uh, causing on reflective dysfunction, so the negative effects that certain sounds can have on the body. So here we are, musical interplay with the chakras. So going down to C now, uh, with the base chakra. Sacred sounds that balance and stimulate. A tone of middle C, which uh, does come in at 5 to 8 hertz, which is also the frequency put out by the sun. It's the frequency our hearts put out when we fall in love. Uh, anything positive really, hence why most things, even if I'm trolling people, you will see me put hearts on. I only ever have a go at somebody if I personally feel threatened. I believe that to be self-defense, but again, judge me all you want. People who judge are usually people who struggle in thinking. But anyway, so sacred sounds that balance and stimulate, tone of middle C, uh, bass and percussive instruments, long U vowel sounds. Physical aspects, it's located at the area of the coccyx at the base of the spine. It's tied to the functions of the circulatory system, the reproductive system, and the functions of the lower extremities. This is our basic life force center. It influences the activities of the testicles and ovaries, the legs and feet, and the pelvic area of the body. Metaphysical aspects. This is our center of life promoting energy. Stimulated properties, it can open an awareness of past life talents and ease fears. It is the seat of the Kundalini within the body. So here we go. Uh, emotional, mental attitudes causing or reflecting dysfunction. Reactive, aggressive, belligerent, manipulative, impulsive, reckless, inability to recognise limits, abrupt, domineering, craving excitement, possessive or territorial, needing approval, acting without thinking, power conscious, 
constantly active, hyperactive, uh, reluctant to defer gratification, bullying, obsessively sexual. So we flick over to the tone of D, just above middle C. Uh, bass, percussive, brass, and woodwind instruments. It's more your old vowel sound. This sensor is tied to the function of the adrenal glands, particularly. It is also a major influence of the reproductive system and the entire muscular system of the body. It influences the eliminative system, the activities of the spleen, bladder, pancreas and kidneys. It is a major sensor influencing and detoxification of the body. This is a sensor influencing sensation and emotion. It is tied to the consciousness of creativity. It is a sensor which controls most personality functions and it can be stimulated to open one to communication with energies and being upon the astral plane. Right, here we go the main bit. Emotional, mental attitudes causing or deflecting dysfunction. Selfishly arrogant, lustful, proud, conceited, vain, mistrustful of others, following the crowd, worried what others think, unable to get along with others, valuing social status, expansive without substance, power seeking, antisocial. Uh, so now we move on to the tone of E, just above middle C, which is the third out of the seven notes on the chromatic scale. Flutes, woodwinds, strings and piano instruments. Vowel sound of R. This centre is linked to the solar plexus area of the physical body. This includes the digestive system, the adrenals, the stomach, the liver and the gallbladder. It assists the body in its assimilation of nutrients. It is also linked to the functions of the left, hem left hemisphere of the brain. Many crippling diseases, ulcers, intestinal problems and uh, psychosomatic diseases are eased by working with this centre. Uh, this centre is tied to the function of clairtestance and general psychic energies and experiences. It also has links to the rational thought process. When activated for non-physical purposes, it can reveal the talents and capacities of other souls. It can open our attunement to the influences of nature's elements. Emotional slash mental attitudes causing or deflecting dysfunction. Feeling deprived of recognition. Aloof. Dogmatic opinionated, fearing group power, isolating, confining life to a narrow view, always planning but never manifesting, constantly needing change and novelty, judgmental, critical, mentally bullying, feeling self is unhearing, absolutist in attitude. So next we have the tone of F, harps, organs, flutes, wind chimes and all string instruments. It's a long A vowel sound. The heart chakra is influential in the function of the thymus gland and the entire immune system. It's tied to the functions of the heart itself and the circulatory system of the body. It affects the assimilation of all nutrients and it's tied to the heart and childhood diseases. Uh, it's linked to the right hemisphere of the brain and its processes. It's also tied to the process of tissue regeneration. Uh, this is the mediating centre of the chakras. It is a centre that awakens compassion and its expression of our lives. It is a centre for expressing higher love and healing energies. If stimulated properly, it opens our sights of our deeper forces in plants and animals. It awakens knowledge of the sentiments and dispositions of others as well. Emotional slash mental attitudes cause, causing or reflecting dysfunction. Angry, always expecting confirmation from others, inability to enforce our own will, financially insecure, emotionally insecure, uncertain, uh, wanting to possess love, needing recognition from others, focused only on self, possessive, jealousy and envious, self-doubting, always blaming others, mistrustful of life. Sounds a little bit like society, that, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, let's move up to G. Tones of G above middle C. Harps, organs, pianos and high string instruments. Vowel sounds of E, I, U and A. The throat chakra is tied to the functions of the throat and the mouth and teeth. The thyroid and the... Blah, 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 glands. Uh, it's influential in the functions of the respiratory system. The functions of the bronchial and vocal apparatus. The alignment canal is also part of its area of influence. This centre is tied to the functions of the right hemisphere of the brain and the creative function of the mind. This can be stimulated to open up the clear audience and to manifest greater abundance. It can be stimulated so as to survey the thoughts of others, telepathy, and it opens the consciousness to insights into the true law of natural phenomenon. Phenomenon. Emotional slash mental attitudes caused by the key of G. Seeking domination over others, surrendering to superiors constantly, trapped by fixed ideas, clinging to traditions, always needing rules and supervisation, being smug and self-satisfied, rigidly dogmatic, resisting change, uh, melancholic, fanatical, rigid and stubborn, authoritarian, being slow to respond. 
Right, so moving on, we move up to uh, the tone of A above middle C. Uh, harps, organs, pianos, wind chimes and high string instruments. The long E vowel sound. Physical aspects, the brow chakra influences the functions of the pituitary gland and uh, the entire system of the body. Also has links to the immune system as well. It affects the synapses of the brain. It's a balancing centre for the functions of the hemisphere of the brain. It is linked to the sinuses, eyes, ears and the face in general. This is the centre for higher clairvoyance and the entire magnetism of the body, the feminine aspects of our energies. It opens one to higher and clearer perceptions. It is intricate in the process of imagination and creative visualisation. It can open one to spiritual vision and the emotional negative effects of this key. Worrying, fearful of the unconscious, fascinated with external intelligence, seeking power for selfish reasons, pursuing idolised relationships, envious of, others ta envious of others' talents, impatient, late for appointments, superstitious, inefficient, unable to live for the now, spaced out, forgetful, fearful of the future, undisciplined, introverted, belittling to others, oversensitive to impressions of others, unable to manifest. Then we move up to uh, the seventh, the last but by no means least important key here, which is the tone of B. Harps, organs, pianos, wind chimes and high string instruments. Again, it's more the long E vowel sound. Physical aspects, the crown chakra is tied to the functions of the nervous system and the entire skeletal system of the body. It influences the pineal gland, all nerve pathways and electrical synapses within the body. It is also linked to the balanced function of the hemispheres of the brain. This chakra is uh, the link to the spiritual essence. It aligns us with the higher forces of the universe. It is powerful of the purification of our subtle bodies, especially in preparing them as separate vehicles of consciousness. It can open you to all of your past lives and how they have led to this point within the present incarnation. It is critical to integrate in your spiritual self with your physical self within the circumstances of your present life. And the negative keys of this is feeling misunderstood, unable to have enduring relationships at deep levels, having intense erotic imaginations, using power to overwhelm others, needing sympathy, critical, feeling shame, self-denial, having a negative self-image, daydreamy, needing to feel popular or indispensable, not understanding need for tenderness. So the last page here that I'll take from the book, uh, if we have a look at the left hand side, uh, tonal and spinal contacts, and that shows roughly what on the spine, where each note affects. Vibrations, whether through tone, sounds or colours, enter through the chakras. They balance the flow of energies within the chakras, and this balanced vibration is then transmitted through the vertebrae of the spine. The vertebrae is an extremely strong sound resonator, and they pick up the sound vibrations and transfer them along the nerve pathways of the organs or tissues. Just showed uh, something I found on Google Images, which ties the seven chakras to each area, and saying like, when I realised number four was my issue, it opened me up to a whole new world. I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but chakra one deals with survival and is blocked by fear. Number two deals with pleasure and is blocked by guilt. Deals with willpower and is blocked by shame. Deals with love and is blocked by grief. Deals with truth and is blocked by lies. Deals with insight and is blocked by illusion. And seven, last but not least, it deals with cosmic energy and is blocked by ego attachment. Now, quite a bold statement I know, but so if you fear anything in your life or you feel guilty or shame or struggling with grief in any way that you can't understand that maybe what happened wasn't your fault and it was somebody else, blocked by lies if you're not telling the truth for any reason, blocked by illusion, believing something that isn't actually meant to be true or blocked by ego attachment, thinking you're something that you're not. Any of those seven things in your life but in my opinion, again, don't take my word for it. I'm just, a, I'm just an idiot, apparently. <laughs> but any one of those seven things could be throwing your whole body off the track with negative energy. Anyway, I'll leave it at that just for the moment. Uh, there's enough for people to take on board there. Uh, cheers for giving up all your time for listening to this. I hope you found it informative. It's, and it really helped me and. Uh, the condition and stuff that I've been in over the past few years. Any comments would be greatly appreciated, either positive or constructive. Don't really like negative energies, as I'm trying to make the point here. Anyway, love and light, and I will catch you next time. Peace out, like.